we sang, Speak What is Truth. Okay? Is it alright if I speak what is truth this morning? Amen. Okay? And it's a good truth. I'm not going to beat anybody up, I promise. Okay? If you have your Bibles, look there in Titus chapter 2, or you can look up on the screens. And the first sentence in chapter, or in verse 11, the only sentence in verse 11, says something that is so dear to my heart. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and we're going to move on. So let, let's read. Let's read it all, and then I can come back to it. It says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasure. We must live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to, what, to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin. To cleanse us and to make us his very own people. Totally committed to doing good deeds. You must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them. You have the authority to correct them when necessary, so don't let anyone disregard what you say. Verse 11. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. That verse, I'll be honest, says more than what we will be able to cover here. This verse speaks of God's grace being revealed and is available to all people. Not some, all. All people. God's salvation is offered to each and every individual that hears the gospel message. That's important for us. That should motivate us as believers. That should help us to understand our great mission. See, but God by His grace sent Christ to earth. And because of Christ's death on the cross, salvation is available to all. Not some. Not a select few, but to anybody who would come. And how do I know that? 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 6 says, This is good and pleasing. And good and pleases God our Savior. Who wants, what's the word? What is it? Everyone. Everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is only one God and one mediator who can re reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This message God gave to the world just at the right time. It's verses like these and an understanding of what one simple word means, all, is why I'm not reformed. Why I believe that salvation is for every man, woman, and child. This is important for us. Because the grace of God was revealed in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. God himself left glory and all its beauty to come and be here with us. We will soon start singing that little song called Emmanuel. God with us. He came and gave his life. Paul and, and Titus brought the life-giving message of Christ to Crete, a very dark place. A place that is much like the world that we live in today. A place filled with sin. A place filled with hopelessness. And Paul and, and Titus brought that message. And those who responded, listen, they're transformed. Old things are passed away and new things come. We become new creatures, new creations in Christ. We're no longer hopeless, but we have hope. But listen, we have to understand that not... Listen, although salvation is available to each and every individual on the face of the planet, there will be those who will reject it. They will reject the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's up to the, between them and God, not between you and me. Our motivation should be to go and tell everyone. To tell everyone the good news that Christ has come. 
that he went to Calvary's cross and he paid the price for our sin. And that we must humble ourselves, confess our sin, and believe that he was raised from the dead. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19 says this, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be an offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. <laughs> this is the good news. You know, I, I, last week, and it, sometimes it gets confusing, and I made the, the, the comment I know for sure in Gateway. I don't know if I made it here. But, you know, there's a reason that I don't put a fish on the back of my truck. It really is. Okay? I wish I could tell you that your pastor lived like an ambassador for Christ and that his life was such a model that, you know, everybody should follow it. But when I get in my truck and a Subaru pulls out in front of me, ambassador goes right out the door, okay? Listen, Paul's encouraging them to live in a manner that shows who they really are. And I'll be honest, I'm under great conviction about that. Today, on the way in, it wasn't a Subaru, okay, but Subaru's an attitude, okay? No, when that car pulled out in front of me and then did the same exact speed as the car that was right next to him in that new four lane or five lane there, all I did was pray for that man's salvation, okay? Because I was going to run him over. <laughs> okay, no. Okay, listen. Paul's encouraging us to live in a manner worthy of our calling. You see, God sent Christ to die for the sins of all humanity. But that each one of us must personally respond by repentance, faith, obedience, and perseverance. It's available to each and every person. It's our responsibility to respond to it. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 10 says, God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done, so, no one, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. You see, salvation it isn't based upon the good things that you've done. At the foot of the cross, it is level. There is nobody who, is, who, who stands at the foot of the cross above anybody else. There's not a good sinner and a bad sinner. Sin is sin and the price for sin is death. And we each have the opportunity here this morning to make a choice. Whether to receive the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on our behalf or take it upon ourselves and suffer death that never ends. To go to a place that we will never die. A place called hell. Listen, God loves you enough to allow you to make that choice. Because He... He desires for us to choose Him. To choose to follow Him. To be like Him. See, so one of the things that I think is so difficult for us is to realize that it really matters how we live and how we love and how we care for people. It's important for us to understand that we truly are ambassadors. And that we live in a dark place. That we live in a place that, that, that desperately needs Christ. Titus is, Paul's making it very clear to Titus that, that he needs to instruct. Verse 12, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we look forward to the hope that that wonderful day 
when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ is revealed. Do you look forward to that day when Christ returns? Do you look forward to it, really? i got to be honest, until I really started studying this over the last month or so, it had been months, if not several months, before I really contemplated the return of Christ and looked. Because we don't think about it, do we? He's been gone 2,000 years. Do you guys remember now, maybe you were brought up different than I was. Uh, when I was, you know, 10, 8, 9, 10 years old, somewhere in there, my mom left me home alone with my brother and my sister. Anybody else get that done? Okay. Now, let's be honest. If mom said she was going to, mom and dad said, hey, listen, we're going to be home at 9 o'clock. I knew the hour that they were going to come home. How do you think my brother and my sister and I lived until 8.45? We lived like hell. Okay? Listen. 8.45 rolled around. We knew that we had to hustle. We had to clean up the blood first and foremost. Okay? Because my brother and I probably were fighting. We had to clean the house. We had to, you know, we had to get everything in order. Because mom knew, we knew when mom was going to get home. And listen, when my mom got home and things weren't right, okay, listen, the beating you got was not worth it, okay? I'm just saying. Listen, we don't know the hour that Jesus is coming back. How are we living? See, when I didn't know that mom, what time mom said, hey, I'm going to be gone for a few minutes... How do you think I lived with the anticipation that she could come back at any moment, at any time? I lived differently. I made sure that if I punched my brother and he got a bloody nose, we cleaned it up immediately. Listen, we live much differently. Because listen, we're living, we should live differently. You know, believers, listen, we need to turn from our godless living and our sinful pleasures. That's what the scripture simply says. We live in an evil world where they reject anything to do with God or God's authority in our life. And we're to live differently. We're to live in such a way that people are attracted to us. And we need to renounce the attitude that God is not coming back. And that it really doesn't matter how we live. Because it does. You know, there's this fallacy, and I've talked about it, that, that you know, I bought fire insurance way back in 1985, November 14th, 1985. I bought fire insurance. And I can live like hell the rest of my life. And I can know that heaven's going to be my home. See, that's a fallacy. Paul's saying it does matter. I'm an ambassador for Christ. And you know, see, sinful pleasures and desires, guys, listen, are what we live in and around. I love what 1 John 2.16 says. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is, from the, is not from the Father, but from this world. Now listen, not everything in this world is bad. Okay, Listen, we have groups that, that, that live, you know, the, the Amish and some of those who, who try not to enter into the world, but listen, they have their own issues of pride and all of that. Okay? Not everything of the world. Listen, you know, going to a football game, is that bad? No. Go, I went hunting, is that? No. There's things in this world that aren't bad that aren't there. Now listen, some of the gloating I did with some of our, you know, Viking fans when you're a Bears fan, and the Bears kicked the living snot out of the Vikings, and I mean, it's just, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Now see, there I just went into the sinful side of things. Okay? Now listen, guys. The message kind of really wraps, helps us wrap our, our brain around it. I'm sorry, my Viking fan over there that I was gloating. Okay, um, The message says this. 
practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. See, the world tells us all those things are important. And yet the Bible tells us that they're not. In fact, it separates us from God. It doesn't allow us to have the intimacy with God. See, as believers, we need to replace those desires with, you know, the positive characteristics of self-control. You know, of right conduct and a devotion to God. <coughs> Listen, sometimes negative motivation isn't bad. But the honest truth is, is, listen, if we're only motivated because we might get in trouble, we're not motivated by love. We're not motivated by the love that should drive us to try and be like Christ and to love like Christ. It's so important for us to do that, guys. See, when we understand you know, what we've been saved from and who we've been saved to be and that we have the power of the Spirit and we have the Word of God to guide us and direct us. We can live differently because of the love that motivates us. You know, with my mom, I eagerly anticipated her return Not because I wanted to see my mom, but because I didn't want to get in trouble when she got home. What motivates you to live in a manner worthy of your calling? Have you considered what you have in Christ? That He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords? And that the punishment that you deserved, he took upon himself. See, we cheapen salvation when we say that, hey, you know, I remember in, in, as a 19-year-old, as a hanging out with my friends and doing drugs and living like hell and talking about Jesus and how much I loved him. I said, that doesn't make sense. It, it, does, it doesn't, doesn't compute. Now, November the 14th, you know, I did surrender my life to him because I realized who he was and what he had done for me. And out of that, that motivated me. First John 3, 2 says, Dear friends, you're already God's children, but He has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know what we will be like, that we will be like Him. For we will see Him as He really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves just as pure as He is pure. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And now you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in Him. Anyone who continues to live, live in Him will not sin, but anyone who keeps on sinning does not know Him or understand who He is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning, because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning, because they are children of God. So now we can tell you who are the children of God and who are the children of devil. If anyone who does not live righteously does not love other believers and does not belong to God. 
thought I would let the Word of God just simply speak for itself. See, we can't say we're one thing and live in a, a different way. We can't continue to do that. Titus 2.14 says, He gave His life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us His very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. You see, when we begin to, to, to focus on His great love for us and understand who we are in Christ and, and what He desires for us, that He desires for us to be like Him, not someday in the future. Listen, if you think that someday in the future I'll desire to be like Jesus, let me tell you, you really don't know Jesus. You really don't. That's what the Scripture just said. Because why would you want something in the future that you don't want right now? You see, because of his great love for me and because of my great love for him, I want to be like him. I want to love like him. I want to serve like him. I want to talk like him. I want to live like Christ lived. I want to die like Christ died. Because of his love for us. Not because he didn't come home and I'm going to get a spanking. But because one day I want to stand before him and hear, well done. I want to have him look at me and say, listen, I'm not pleased that you because you did all of these great things. I'm pleased with you because you desired to become like me. And you've become like me. You see, he gave his life to free me from sin. He gave his life so that I could be committed to doing good deeds. Christ paid that ultimate price. And He took away the bondage that kept you and I trapped as sinners. And He's given us a new life in Him. He gave us that new life by His blood that cleanses us, that washes us and purifies us. Hebrews 9, 12 says, with his own blood, not with the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all, and time, once for all time, and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow could cleanse people's bodies from, cere from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify your conscience from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Because this is important for us. When God views us from heaven... When he looks at Curtis, when he looks at you, if we know Christ as our Lord and Savior, he sees us as perfect and holy. He sees us without spot or blemish. He sees us through the blood of Christ. That's from heaven's view. But from earth's view, I still got a lot that needs to be worked out, that needs to be done away with. That's the process of sanctification in our lives. That as I begin to walk in this relationship with God out of love, not duty, out of great love for Him. Because, listen, I was once bound for a place called hell. And I was snatched from the jaws of death and destruction by the grace of God. And he washed me off and he cleansed me and he purified me and he set me up on my feet. And he says, now walk with me and become like me. That's a process over a lifetime. Let me ask, are you on that journey? Titus says, listen, Paul said to Titus, you must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them. 
Now listen, there's two ways that we can do this. And I've been part of both churches, okay? We can do it. We can sit down and the elders can get together. And the truth of the matter is there's already a lot of them out there. We can put a list of do's and don'ts together. That if you do this, you're a good Christian. And if you do this, you're not a Christian. Anybody want that system? And then the pastor and the elders become, if you will, the referees that determine what's good and bad and ugly. Or the system that God, I think, really created, that each man would be responsible. Because then, see, I become responsible for you. All I'm responsible to do is encourage you to live right, to love God and to love others. The other system is, is whether it's this, and I just pick it up because I got it as a prop, that each one of us begin to read and understand who God designed us to be and who He's called us to be and how much love He has for us. And we encourage each other to live in a manner worthy of our calling. One brings judgment and, 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 and pharisaical behavior that I'm better than you because I did this and you didn't. Or we begin to really understand by God's Word as we wash and purify ourselves with the Word and the Spirit. That we begin to pray for each other and encourage each other and love each other. Because listen, I, I, I have news for you. I know you guys think I'm perfect. Okay? I'm not. I'm messed up, screwed up, I'm broken. Anybody else that way? That needs God's grace? Not His judgment because you're not keeping, quote, the rules? Now listen, when the Bible says don't, we should what? Don't. When it says do, we should what? It's a pretty simple concept. The problem is, is 90% of us will go home and never crack our Bible. And we'll wonder why we're living a defeated life. The 10% of us who do crack the Bible will crack it out of duty, not out of love and passion. Listen, when we fall in love with Jesus... And we understand what he did for us. We can't continue to live the same way. The Spirit of God begins to live in us and begins to take control. And the things that I desire to do, the things of the flesh, soon fade. And all I want to do is be like Jesus. I want to love like him. I want to serve like him. Ultimately, I want to die like Him. Will we do the things that we should? Yes. But it's not because me or an elder or somebody else stands up and points at the bony finger and says, you must do this. It's because we've fallen so in love with Christ that when the Word is preached, when we read what He teaches us, our desire will to be like Him and to please Him. Who are you in love with this morning? Yourself? Or are you in love with Christ? Here's the great news. You get to choose. And He simply says, come. Come. Say, man, I've known him for a long time, but I'm not in love with him anymore. If you'll cry out, he'll meet you right there. And those same nail-scarred hands that held you close will hold you again. Let's pray. Father, I praise you and I thank you. Father, I thank you for your great love. that we have the privilege of being your ambassadors and to live, that salvation is available to every man, woman, and child. And that because of your grace, 
you receive us just the way we are. Messed up and screwed up. And Father, we have some that are here this morning that, that may not know that grace yet. We've had others who honestly maybe have made a mockery of your grace. Because they don't live for you. They don't love you. Then there's some of us, Father, who have just fallen into a routine. It's not that we've fallen out of love. It's just that the passion isn't there. Father, rekindle that passion within us. Give us a desire to be like Jesus. That we won't do the things that we do because we're going to get in trouble. But we'll do the things that we need to do because we love you. And want to be like you. If you're here this morning and you need to fall in love with Jesus, just cry out. Here am I. Here am I. And he'll meet you there. Let us stand and let us worship.